Welcome, everyone. Also, on behalf of Apostolus Potiades, uh, with whom I organize this uh, webinar. Welcome to all the speakers that we have, very interesting speakers with a lot of expertise and different backgrounds, and also to the audience. Uh, I just heard that we have over 300 people who have registered for this webinar, so this also shows how much of interest this uh, topic is. And uh, let's hope that we have an effective webinar uh, with uh, common solutions and, and answers at the end of the webinar, or at least steps, a first step uh, on our way to find uh, common solutions. Because this webinar is about uh, human rights compliance at the border and how this can be best monitored. Uh, since we have common rules, on controlling the borders, safeguarding human rights compliance has been an issue, an important but also delicate element, uh, always part of the debates. Uh, and this is logical, of course, because uh, since the border controls that we have, even without before the common rules, there are these allegations of pushbacks, persistent allegations, which means that people uh, uh, do not have a right to asylum, can run the risk of uh, refoulement, uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, well, sometimes are treated uh, not with human dignity. So these are important fundamental rights that are at stake at the moment that the border control is not operated in line with our fundamental rights. This is not a theoretical exercise, unfortunately. We have these reports time and time again, uh, I had a report on that in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe last year, which was adopted with a large majority with a lot of recommendations, but also now in the European Parliament, the Schengen Scrutiny Group, for instance, is very critical towards the allegations and urging the Commission to do uh, its work on uh, uh, controlling uh, uh, this compliance with fundamental rights. Member states themselves are responsible, of course, for this compliance, but uh, Frontex, uh, an agency uh, with a mandate to support the member states, has a responsibility as well in their own operation and also in how it supports and advises the member states in controlling the borders. However, there are still, uh, there is, there are improvements uh, during the years in legislation. We see more attention for fundamental rights. We see the fundamental rights officer, we have a complaint mechanism, uh, but still we hear uh, a lot of problem issues on the ground. And this is what we want to uh, focus on today. It's so not everything that goes well, because there are also many things that go well. But now we really want to focus on what are the current and persistent problem issues? How can we tackle them? What is actually uh, needed? Uh, what improvement, what additional instruments in order to make sure that we have a good, independent, transparent uh, monitoring of uh, the human rights compliance, both by member states and by uh, Frontex. Uh, and maybe we can find, and we will do that in the second panel also to see, do we need a new instrument? Do we need external bodies uh, tasked with uh, monitoring? And if so, how could improvements exactly look like. At the time of planning of this event, which should be a cozy event in the parliament with only 20 people attending it, <laughs> we could not foresee that it was so timely as uh, the COVID-19 measures are, are also very challenging for this issue, of course, with the closing of the borders, so many measures member states take in order to protect their society. Uh, but at the same time, when we planned this event, we already had a lot of occasions that urged for this event. The upcoming new pact, for instance, which may also require good mechanisms for, uh, for monitoring. Think of new border procedures, for instance. The revision of the Schengen evaluation and monitor mechanism, which actually really looks at improvements specifically on uh, fundamental rights compliance but also regarding Frontex, which has increased immensely in capacity, but also in its mandate, including on returns in operations abroad, which also, of course, shows that that needs to go hand in hand with uh, safeguards in better uh, uh, monitoring of uh, human rights compliance. Uh, 
So I think we have a lot of uh, reasons, and this is also why there's so much interest, I think. Um, so without further ado, I would like to start with our first panel. Uh, and uh, my idea is to introduce each speaker just before they start speaking, so that it's still in, fresh in the minds of the, of the audience. Uh, but everyone has a great experience uh, and, and expertise. This first panel is, uh, uh, has the objective to map the current gaps and the problem issues with fundamental rights at the border. And uh, we have uh, uh, expertise from an, an investigative journalist and a researcher, uh, Apostolos Fortianis, with whom I got the idea of organizing this. He will present his research that he did in different spots where Frontex was uh, operating. And he drew some conclusions uh, on what he found, how we, uh, Frontex operated and how it cooperated with the member states. And uh, after that, we will give the floor also the perspective of the EU Ombudsman, who did a lot of research on complaint mechanism, on accountability of Frontex. And after that, the second part of this first panel is more general, not only on Frontex, but also member states, what is happening at the border and what are the factors playing a role that make it so difficult to have access to monitoring and to have access to legal redress and uh, accountability. But first we start with Apostolos uh, Fatiotis. Uh, you have the floor. Hello uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you Mrs. Twig for taking the initiative to bring us all together here to discuss the issue. Uh, my intention is to go quickly through some uh, facts and uh, put the picture together uh, on which we can then try to discuss uh, how adequate and uh, efficient uh, the current system is and uh, you know, follow-up speakers you know, could uh, discuss uh, what the improvements can be on this uh, situation. Uh, uh, Frontex is expected to monitor uh, operations uh, it organizes uh, on the field, as well as the return operations it coordinates and co-finances. And uh, it's expected to provide an effective mechanism, as uh, this is written down in the returns directive. Uh, the most uh, specific instrument that is expected to, to do that is the internal reporting system Frontex has put in place uh, since 2016 or even before uh, in order to be able to uh, take the picture from the field and analyze it. Uh, specifically, the instrument, uh, the, the most specific instrument is the serious incidents reports, uh, which the escorts uh, uh, or the deployed personnel is expected to file when something isn't going uh, as uh, expected or is not uh, normal. Uh, now, if someone goes back uh, a few years and looks into the uh, coordinated returns operations uh, and try to figure out how much this reporting system has delivered, uh, the numbers are uh, quite surprising. Uh, from uh, Frontex's own uh, documents, it accused that uh, in 17, for 341 flights, there was no serious incident report submitted from any escorts, although there were uh, reports uh, submitted from the monitors Frontex uh, is asking to follow up, the, to, to join uh, the flights and uh, follow. Uh, there were, uh, almost 100 uh, reports from monitors during the first and the second semester of the year. In the next year, in 2018, uh, there is uh, 345 flights coordinated or co-financed uh, by Frontex. All the type of types of flights uh, Frontex is involved with. Uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics now. Um, there's two serious incident reports filed Although one notices uh, that uh, both of them uh, are about uh, incidents uh, in which uh, escorts were attacked uh, by returnees. Uh, in the first semester of 2019, uh, there is uh, 163 
uh, return operations uh, coordinated. And again, there is no serious incident report uh, filed. Uh, although there's about 94 reports submitted by forced return monitors uh, during the time, and one complaint uh, regarding a possible uh, pre uh, Now, if someone uh, puts these numbers together, it also notices that the number of flights being monitored, which means there's a physical presence of a monitor on board, is gradually uh, but uh, consistently increasing which means that Frontex is actually taking uh, seriously uh, to, to make sure that there is a monitor on board uh, on most of the flights, and it does its best to increase the presence of monitors. Uh, and uh, if somebody takes uh, these numbers uh, as they speak, uh, for what they speak, then uh, we almost discuss here about a near perfect picture. Uh, there's no uh, things going wrong since there's almost no uh, serious incidents reports, uh, monitors are present, they file their reports. Uh, we don't really know, we're not able to know what is included in the reports since they are not public uh, in any way. But uh, uh, there's no noise on the side of Frontex uh, of uh, you know, measures being taken or concern being expressed about the content of these reports. Now, in the very few occasions that uh, the outsiders have an opportunity to look into the system, uh, the picture changes. Uh, in one occasion of a CPT monitoring of one flight from Munich to Kabul in Afghanistan on August 14th, 2018, for which no serious incident report was filed, uh, uh, we read in the CPT uh, findings uh, that uh, you know, a person uh, on the flight was molested by the escorts uh, and that extreme force was used to contain uh, uh, the incident uh, that had occurred. Uh, another uh, one, one of other uh, of these rare opportunities to look into the system are the observation uh, of return uh, operations documents. Uh, the fundamental rights officers files to uh, the administrative board of Frontex, which are internal documents. Uh, some of those exist because of uh, access to document requests. Uh, for the document uh, uh, regarding the first semester of 2019 uh, and only the paragraph that concerns the use of force during uh, return flights, uh, there's a few bullet points. The evidence is still very thin. It's just a digest of the monitor's reports. And on this one, uh, you know, someone can read about several reported cases in which the applied means of restraints were not considered necessary by the monitors or either legal or proportionate, as defined in the Frontex implementation plan of the flight. Uh, in some cases, the monitors expressed doubts whether the means of restraints were used in accordance with the principles of necessity and proportionality, or whether they were reasonable uh, concerning the situations. Uh, this description of uh, uh, situations uh, where up to 10 escorts were holding one returnee uh, who was also body cap, in body caps at the time, uh, which makes one actually wonder uh, what kind of situation uh, you know, uh, would take place uh, requiring 10 escorts to sit on top of a return knee and uh, nobody then feel, out of these 10 escorts feel appropriate to file a serious incident report as in these six months there were no serious incident report filed. There's a few other details but in order to save some time, uh, I will skip them. Now, the question that occurs uh, here is uh, whether uh, uh, the picture we see coming from uh, whatever is public available is the perspective uh, uh, the agency prefers to, to create uh, on about uh, what happens uh, in, during uh, its uh, return, uh, coordinated return uh, flights and uh, whether this uh, perspective is a very selective one. Uh, this is a question uh, that is very serious and needs to be addressed. Uh, uh, it also connects to how the executive director of Frontex uses the absence of serious incidents reports as a very strong argument against uh, people that uh, you know, move to bring questions to the table on uh, how appropriate and effective the system is. Uh, 
Uh, a very good example is uh, the situation in Hungary in 16 and 17, when uh, despite the proposal of the consultative forum of Frontex to suspend the operations on the field, and despite uh, a series of internal documents from the fundamental rights offices raising very serious questions about the possibility of Frontex aiding and abetting violations of human rights on the Hungarian-Serbian border, uh, the absence of uh, you know, reports being produced from the internal reporting system uh, became the absolute, uh, the absolute argument in order to uh, take these questions off the table. Uh, 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 even in the case of uh, meetings with organizations that are able to concentrate and produce specific evidence, like MSF, for example, who provided uh, you know, medical reports for over 100 cases of reported abuse, different kinds of abuses, uh, occasionally very violent uh, situations. Uh, the response was that uh, perhaps uh, there's been confusion about where these incidents happen, uh, but given that the system uh, has registered two or three in serious incidents reports maximum, uh, there was no adequate evidence on the side of Frontex in order to, to follow up uh, uh, more than uh, what already is predicted. Uh, no suspension took place in Hungary at the time, but uh, the question remains uh, for anybody that has access even to this limited evidence on whether the system can adequately address uh, uh, the problems and whether uh, it is independent enough uh, in order to react in case of systemic failure. The answer is not, uh, the question is not answered yet. Now, on top of this persistent uh, challenge, there's another uh, issue which is upcoming a very serious uh, and has to do with uh, Frontex uh, increasingly uh, employing the services of private contractors to assist in its um, modern operations uh, in uh, the external frontier of the European Union and mostly in the central Mediterranean at the time. There's manned flights and uh, unmanned drone flights uh, being deployed who uh, create lifetime footage, uh, almost near lifetime footage, uh, that goes through a very sophisticated system, uh, you know, returns uh, into the hands of uh, officers that do search and rescue. Uh, either the Italian uh, and Maltese authorities, European Union authorities, or the Libyan authorities as well. The discussion is very well uh, known uh, about the situation in the Central Mediterranean and the questions about how the European Union is involved with the Libyan authorities and the Libyan Coast Guard. But what is not very clear is what is the legal framework uh, within which uh, these private contractors operate when it comes to protection of fundamental rights? Uh, who is there to monitor actually how they implement their instructions? or to you know, make uh, obvious what the you know, uh, possibility for legal redress and legal remedies uh, uh, for those who want to push further and question further the implementation of these uh, services. Uh, now, with, uh, this is more or less a framework when it comes to the challenges, uh, uh, persistent and novel challenges uh, uh, that uh, we see evolving. And uh, I have to say that and close with it as well, that um, the reaction of the agency to the mounting uh, number of questions uh, lately is not encouraging. On the contrary, one can observe that uh, uh, in instead of uh, uh, you know, a proactive uh, response to engage and to enter into dialogue with uh, critics or with uh, public interlocutors, uh, the agency is actually withdrawing from the public debate. There is a number of uh, points that uh, uh, you know, speak to that. Uh, for example, uh, lately the, uh, the agency uploaded a password uh, page uh, uh, on its website uh, in which people uh, who make access to document requests have to register with the password given to them by the agency in order to uh, be able to access the documents if they are released which actually makes it uh, very difficult uh, for um, uh, transparency activists who had organized uh, web pages to help people do access document requests, uh, actually uh, keep helping uh, in this way, or who make it uh, will be done in one minute.
actually, if you're, yeah, uh, or um, uh, make these uh, documents uh, permanently publicly available. So for other researchers or journalists or transparency activists to use them in the future. Uh, also, this is the occasion of uh, a controversy between uh, a couple of transparency activists who took Frontex to court in uh, Luxembourg and the agency who has appeared to ask them for uh, disproportionate uh, legal fees uh, after they lost the case, uh, which to an extent uh, uh, sound punitive uh, because of the size of the amount being requested. And uh, finally, there is uh, the event of April 15th where uh, Frontex decided to ban tracking of uh, uh, the contracted flights uh, doing monitoring the Central Mediterranean from flight tracking websites after uh, you know, the, a very, very serious incident that uh, uh, occurred uh, during that day. So the general impression is that uh, the criticism is not uh, uh, accepted uh, uh, entirely, and uh, you know, the, the point is not being made uh, very openly. Uh, but uh, uh, the numbers, uh, you know, I, I think, speak for themselves. Uh, the, the questions are open and need to be discussed. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Apostolos, for this overview. May I just <clears throat> wrap up very briefly? Uh, what you actually describe, what you found out in your research, is that there's a big discrepancy between what monitoring groups uh, observe as violations and the conclusions by Frontex, uh, and also that uh, urgent calls from the consultative forum, which is also a kind of monitoring body, and Elise will explain more about it, uh, also has not been followed up, request to suspend operation. Actually, I think you show in this way your concerns that the monitoring bodies or systems that we have do not seem to be effective or not because of a lack of a follow-up by Frontex. Furthermore, you, uh, you express your concerns about private contractors and the fundamental right compliance, and you give some examples of which it, it seems to be the case that more criticisms leads to withdrawal from the public debate from less tr transparency. Now, thank you for this. Um, you had more time, of course, because of your presentation. Next speakers uh, have the constraint of uh, um, eight minutes, uh, but I'm sure they will manage. And I would like to give the floor to Fergal O'Regan. He's head of inquiry unit at the EU Ombudsman Office. And the EU Ombudsman played a major role in opening up Frontex, actually, and making sure that the accountability mechanism uh, would improve. So I'm very curious to hear about your uh, observations on, on to what improvement it has led and what's your conclusion now about the current mechanism, especially the complaint mechanism. And maybe you can start a little bit by um, explaining the role of the EU Ombudsman uh, in this uh, issue. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, um, first of all, again, thank you for your efforts, especially given the fact that uh, you've had to, uh, let's say, reorganize the conference and, and put together the uh, technical elements to allow us all to speak. So I, I thank you very much uh, for that. Um, before giving you a brief outline of the, the competences of the Ombudsman has tried to achieve as regards um, uh, Frontex and ensuring the respect for fun fundamental rights. Uh, let me just maybe underline the context that we're, we're, we're facing at the moment. Uh, um, uh, it's particularly important uh, that the EU at this point in time in its history um, is consistent um, with our, our, our shared values and principles, our, 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 our fund fundamental rights which are common to the member states. Uh, we, uh, we have to ensure that, especially at this time, of crisis that we show our best selves and that we are consistent with these principles that establish what we are as a, 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 as, as, as a union. Um, in a context where there is significant tensions, um, tensions regarding the control of immigration on the one side and also um, uh, um, uh, uh, the respect for fundamental rights. And if, if, um, if, if persons and entities are going to operate under an EU flag, we must ensure 
that they are in compliance with our shared values and, and principles. Uh, the European Ombudsman has a mandate to uh, control whether all EU institutions, bodies, offices, and agencies, um, which obviously except um, uh, 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 comply with principles of good administration. Fundamental rights, the respect for fundamental rights, uh, is one core aspect of, 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 of good administration. And the Ombudsman has, in many areas, uh, sought to ensure that um, the EU public administration um, complies with fundamental rights. This is all the more important in those areas where fundamental the respect for fundamental rights are essential and the potential for an infringement of fundamental rights has such an enormous impact uh, on the persons concerned. And especially where those persons are vulnerable uh, uh, and the, the imbalance of power is, 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 is very stark. Um, the Ombudsman in that regard, we, I think, has a very particularly important role. I mean, the courts always are a backstop to legality and a control on the administration, but courts are heavy uh, mechanisms of control. They take a long time, they take a lot of money, and particularly those persons who are the most weak in our society very often don't have real access to courts, even if they have the right to have an access to court, whether they uh, actually do or not is, is, is debatable given the, the, the nature of that, uh, of, 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 of the system of judicial, judicial control. The Ombudsman, unlike courts, can also be proactive in the area of Frontex have been own initiative in courts primarily. I mean, there have been a number of access to documents cases as well, but it's the Ombudsman on her own initiative, uh, which has proactively look to see where there are problems and proactively suggested solutions. In that context, let me underline, the Ombudsman has no binding power. The Ombudsman can't order the institutions to change their Let's just and that go back to where we were when, um, uh, when Emily O'Reilly issued her first special report uh, regarding Frontex. Um, um, we had the, that 2011 regulation. Um, we obviously had the obligation of compliance uh, with the Charter. We had the Code of Conduct, the uh, obligation of the Code of, Con Code of Conduct, and we had the Fundamental Rights Officer. But the Ombudsman proactively, looking at her experience in other areas, and primarily referring to her experience with the EIB, recognized that significant improvements were needed in order so as to make effective the respect for fundamental rights. It's one thing to have it in the law. And there's no doubt the law exists. We have a duty to respect fundamental rights, but are they respected? Do we have the mechanisms in place to ensure that they are respected? And the Ombudsman was able to go to suggest improvements going beyond the 2011 regulation to create a complaints mechanism um, there was no legal obligation to do so at that time. Um, but by putting forward this suggestion, which was rejected, remember at the time it was rejected by Frontex. The Ombudsman made a recommendation of Frontex, which was rejected. And then Emily O'Reilly made her special report to Parliament, which had an impact on the political environment. It created awareness of the importance of this fundamental change to ensure um, uh, an accountability mechanism. We can discuss later to what extent is it effective, but remember, it wasn't there from the beginning. So um, that led to a situation in uh, where the European Parliament supported the Ombudsman's resolution, and thereafter we saw the complaints mechanism being incorporated into law. So even though the Ombudsman is not a binding system of control, can only make recommendations. It is a very strong moral authority. By using her own initiative powers, uh, the Ombudsman was able to um, eventually um, ensure that even legally binding obligations have a complaint mechanism were in introduced. And this also, the same point can be made as regards uh, the conditions for returns. 
the Ombudsman made a whole, in a separate own initiative inquiry, made a whole series of um, uh, uh, suggestions to Frontex as regards reinforcing specific aspects of its, uh, its returns policy, uh, protection of, of minors, uh, uh, for example. Um, uh, um, obviously, by pointing these out, by raising awareness, by putting it to Frontex, look, you have to make changes here. Um, um, uh, we would expect um, uh, uh, for significant change to be met. Um, I underline again, the Ombudsman, uh, when I mentioned the courts, I said it's a rather inflexible, time-consuming, expensive mechanism of control. The Ombudsman is free, it's flexible, that said, we do not get we do not get uh, uh, any significant immediate complaints about uh, about uh, what's happening on the ground, and this is this is one issue which would be a, a worry. Is it is that escaping us, and is it possible that the ombudsman should should be using her own initiative powers to a greater extent? Um, for example, uh, go back to the uh, the, the, the point that uh, Professor Fotiadis mentioned concerning. The monitors. It is a great thing now that monitors exist, and I note that in the 2009 uh, obligation on Frontex to ensure that in all of its operations, monitors are present, and even a specific obligation to have at least um, uh, 40, 40 monitors. Does that system function well? Clearly, obviously, it's 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 resulting in the identification of more cases than would otherwise be identified. But is it functioning optimally? Are cases, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, falling through the gaps? Uh, and uh, you know that that comes down to maybe asking the question: Well, who controls the controller? Yes, you have a complaints mechanism. I mean, obviously, the monitors are uh, feeding information into the system. So you have mechanisms of control there. So who's controlling whether those control mechanisms function? Obviously the ombudsman is there. I, I understand the debate will focus on whether or not you need some form of external mechanism as well. But I would just want to point out for the situation as it stands today, the ombudsman is there to help whenever we can. Of course, we're dependent on getting the good complaints so that uh, we can act, or uh, alternatively, we can look to see whether we can use our our, our own initiative, our own initiative powers. Um, so, with that, I leave the time for the other speakers. Uh, of course, uh, I'd be delighted. <coughs> Thank you very much, okay. Thank you very much. I think, indeed, it was very informative um, uh, how you explained how the EU Ombudsman stepped in the gap, actually, uh, of accountability of Frontex and that it indeed led to a better legislation. And you also show that still uh, Ombudsman needs to be alert and, and, and see if they need to take up a new response. And, and maybe this event or other events will help in the thinking of what the Ombudsman can do. But you are right. You are already a kind of external uh, uh, monitoring body. But we need to make sure that there is enough relation between what is really happening on the ground with the current system and the possibilities, the channels that we have outside. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for that. And now I would like to go to Annalise Baldaccini, Executive Officer of the EU Office of Amnesty International. Uh, Annalise, uh, and you are also, as uh, on behalf of Amnesty, member of the consultative forum uh, of Frontex. Maybe you can very briefly say something about how it works for everybody to understand. Uh, but you also go to go focus on human rights defenders, so actors, NGOs, other actors who uh, do want to play or try to play a monitoring role and the problem issues that they encounter while uh, uh, doing their work. And maybe then from your contribution, we can uh, select some factors that may play a role in uh, getting a good effective uh, monitoring system. The floor is yours, Annelies. Uh, thank you, Tineke, um, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, 
um, for the opportunity really to address all of you on a matter that is uh, of great importance to Amnesty. Um, yes, uh, to go to the um, uh, the role of the of the consultative forum first. Uh, let me first clarify an important issue that the consultative forum has is not a monitoring body as such. It is uh, actually an advisory body uh, in terms of the mandate under the regulation and also um, in, for the capacity. It has no. It would wouldn't have any monitoring capacity as such. Um, the consultative forum uh, relies on on external resources and on the, on the work of the Fundamental Rights Office uh, in Frontex for to come to specific recommendations and conclusions such as those that were mentioned previously on uh, um, recommending suspension, for example, of the operations at the Hungarian and Serbian border. We don't, uh, this is not the, the outcome of, uh, of independent or monitoring of the con consultative forum itself. Um, I think it's important to highlight that because uh, we do not, the consultative forum as such is really not, shouldn't be considered part of the monitoring mechanism and it's not in, in, in a position to ensure any level of accountability uh, of the agency as such. Um, having clarified that, I would like uh, to address um, in my capacity as, uh, um, as an officer of, of the of Amnesty International um, to flag some of our research and particularly on the impact of European migration policies, excessive focus on border protection, which is evidenced amongst others by an increasingly bigger and more powerful European border agency and the difficulties and challenges this poses for civil society and human rights organizations, including in undertaking monitoring of what is happening at the borders. Um, we have recently published a, a new report called Punishing Compassion, Solidarity on Trial in Fortress Europe, in which we, are, we have documented the criminalization of individuals and organizations who help people at borders out of humanitarian motives, um, in recent years, individuals and civil society organizations that have helped refugees and migrants have been subjected to unfounded criminal proceedings, undue restrictions of their activities, intimidation, harassment, smear campaigns in several European countries. Their acts of assistance and solidarity have placed them on a collision course with European migration policies, these are policies aimed at preventing refugees and migrants from reaching the EU or at containing them, uh, those who make it to Europe um, in European countries at, at external borders, which are then the first country of arrival. By rescuing refugees and migrants in danger at sea or in the mountains, offering them food and shelter, documenting police and border guard abuses, and opposing unlawful deportations, these people have been exposed they have exposed the cruelty that is, that is caused by immigration policies and have become themselves the target of authorities. We have documented, for example, NGOs in Croatia, such as Are You Serious and the Center for Peace Studies, uh, that have been harassed, intimidated, and prosecuted for facilitating irregular migration after becoming uncomfortable witnesses to the authorities' pushbacks and collective expulsions at border with Bosnia-Herzegovina and Serbia. We have documented instances uh, of trained rescuers in Greece, um, um, such as Sam Binder, who volunteered with a local NGO to help refugees and migrants disembarking in Lesbos after a dangerous sea journey, spending over 100 years in pre-trial detention, uh, facing accusations of facilitating irregular entry, espionage, money laundering and forgery. It is well known uh, the persistent um, smear campaign fueled in Italy by govern government officials against NGOs conducting search and rescue operations at sea, which has been accompanied by the imposition of a code of conduct, passing of laws aimed at restricting and hampering life-saving activities in the central Mediterranean. We know of criminal investigations for facilitating irregular entry and the offenses have been have affected the crews of most of the NGOs and have led to multiple instances of impounding of NGO rescue vessels. So su such blatant attempts 
to silence organizations, publicly disparage their work and forcing them to stop their activities have left organizations and individuals in precarious positions, facing baseless prosecutions and in fear of reprisals and concerns for their safety. And because these helpers step in to fill the protection and assistance gap left by states, which fail in their obligations, criminalizing them results in leaving people on the move in even more precarious conditions. Um, criminalization results also in undermining the watchdog role of individuals and organizations in many critical border areas at land or sea. This is at a time where there is continued consistent allegations of denial of access to uh, the territory of the EU at external borders. There is a consistent allegations of pushbacks at external land and sea borders with EU institutional players refraining from calling out member states for measures which deny access to the territory, access to asylum and enforce border protection with questionable means. We are concerned about the ways in which in practice more resources dedicated to the protection of the EU external borders can be reconciled with the protection of the rights of people and families on the move. Let's think about the images we saw at the Greek-Turkish border in the beginning of March. This showed Greek authorities repressing the movement of people attempting to cross by sending in police and army forces who used tear gas, water cannons, plastic bullets and life ammunition. People have reported being beaten by border guards being detained at sites uh, in the border and then pushed back, pushed back to Turkey. Some people have died. The right to asylum was suspended. In response from the EU, the response from the EU was yet more resources going to border protection, with no calls being made to the Greek authorities to investigate serious allegations of disproportionate use of force, violence and pushbacks by border authorities. So to conclude, there should be acknowledgement that individuals and organizations on the ground in many counties provide key services to asylum seekers, to migrants, including, for instance, rescue services. They fill the gap of governments which are failing in their obligations. Their work should not be criminalized, but enabled and protected. We would like to see a lot more transparency and accountability built into the management of European borders, including through assets and resources deployed by the European Border Agency, by Frontex. Amnesty has worked for decades to hold national police forces to account for misconduct and we cannot have a supranational border agency that is increasingly active on the ground that can witness violations and even contribute to them but is not accountable to the public. We would want states to put in place robust and independent monitoring mechanism at their borders and in the green border area in order to increase police transparency and accountability. As a start, they should, for example, respect existing national monitoring and accountability mechanism, including, for instance, the offices of the ombudsperson, allowing for public and institutional scrutiny of national migration policies and practices. And finally, we think the EU must put in place an effective monitoring and oversight system to ensure that the funding it provides to member states for the purposes of border protection does not encourage or contribute to human rights violations. This is my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much, Annelies, for for this uh, this plea for uh, uh, for a stronger position of human rights defenders. And actually, you say also that uh, you know where you see an increase of border control capacity, you see even more uh, problems, more complications for human rights defenders to monitor what is happening with these capacities. So the gap is becoming bigger. Uh, although the money and the capacity for border control has grown. So actually it's very convincing that you say that should go hand in hand some way uh, or the other. Mm -hmm. and, and the commission should also uh, uh, make sure that this is happening in the member states. Thank you very much for, uh, for this position and especially thanks of course because you were, uh, you were prepared to step in on such a short notice uh, because Sergio Carrera, who was uh, originally um, invited, uh, had uh, family circumstances that he had to uh, to cancel. But I'm very happy with your contribution, Annalise. My then pleasure. we go to the last speaker of the uh, this first panel, and uh, this is Catherine Woolard, director of ECRA.
And um, uh, you are going to dwell on um, a more the general picture, actually, of the current gaps in, in accountability, uh, responsibility, both on the political level, but also on the legal level. What policy, possibilities are there to hold the, um, uh, the agencies and the member states accountable? The floor is yours, Catherine. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm going to run through the existing internal and external accountability mechanisms um, and I'll comment on both the flaws and recommendations for improvement when it comes to each of these existing accountability mechanisms. So if we go down, let's start with the internal side. Um, we would highlight the fundamental rights officer um, the position of fundamental rights officer exists within Frontex. This is something that is essential. With the latest mandate change, we've seen an increase in resources for the fundamental rights officer, including the creation of a deputy fundamental rights officer position and the creation of fundamental rights monitors. Nonetheless, on the other side, um, there are long-standing questions about whether the fundamental rights officer and the team there has adequate resources. And I think this relates to the point just mentioned about needing to have proportionate investment and proportionate monitoring capacity, including internally. So since 2015, we've seen a doubling in size of the staff and the budget of Frontex. So I think that would uh, require a larger increase in the internal fundamental rights capacity. Um, Secondly, there is a question about the independence of the fundamental rights officer, uh, given the organisational positioning of that role uh, and a certain dependency on the management of, uh, of uh, Frontex. The, again, the recent mandate change included useful language on ensuring the independence of the fundamental rights officer, but there have been concerns uh, recently particularly linked to recruitment of the new fundamental rights positions. And second uh, mechanism to mention, the complaints mechanism. This has already been referred to by other speakers. This has also improved, and I think it's improved very much due to the act of the fundamental rights officer. Um, so we see more clarity in terms of the roles, the timing, the actions required uh, following complaints. We see a responsibility for emissions as well as actions and also a certain amount of follow-up required from member states when their personnel are subject to complaints. Nonetheless, uh, on the side of weaknesses, there's also a question about independence of the complaints mechanism, uh, given the strong role of the management of Frontex. And I think there's an ongoing question about the reality of an individual complainant actually being able to access the complaints mechanism, uh, given, given who we're talking about, the quite um, vulnerable people who, for a variety of reasons, uh, might struggle to access such a complaints mechanism. Um, moving down, the consultative forum has been mentioned. I would classify it as an accountability mechanism, not a monitoring mechanism for the reasons explained by Annalisa. Um, it has played a role in highlighting the risks, the fundamental rights risks uh, attached to Frontex's work also in mapping and establishing accountability, putting pressure in very egregious cases. And there I would note the continuation of the operation in Hungary, uh, where the forum highlighted the concerns about that. Um, and also advising on improvements, particularly on return operations. Nonetheless, uh, again, there are questions about access to information for the forum and also the follow-up actions that result after the forum has intervened. Um, moving down, the uh, Code of Conducts and linked to that serious incident reporting mechanisms. Um, here we've already heard about the, the uh, difficulties of an under-reporting of serious incidents. Um, I would add there particular areas like the need for additional monitors when it comes to return operations and particularly when it comes to Frontex coordinated national return operations, although we see a, um, a, a solid progress in terms of the numbers. To conclude on these internal accountability mechanisms, I think overall the 
the questions and the weaknesses are linked to the actions that follow from the use of such mechanisms. And here I think there are ongoing questions about the priorities and the commitment to fundamental rights of the current leadership of Frontex. Um, and there we've already heard mention of a number of uh, lack of actions, lack of follow up, but also things like the need for suspension of operations where uh, due diligence shows that fundamental rights um, are not being observed. Um, I would note that it's not just about accountability for violations. Uh, there's also a positive responsibility to prevent violations and actually a positive obligation on Frontex to promote fundamental rights. So we could envisage um, a far stronger role. Let me conclude by looking beyond the internal to the uh, let's say, statutory and then independent um, mechanisms. Legal remedies at national level. For activities in member states, Frontex does not have the power to investigate. Um, uh, that liability exists under the civil and criminal law of the member states themselves. Um, there we may see a reluctance of the member states to act, but we are also aware of rule of law problems in a number of member states, particularly at the borders. Um, there's also the question now of third country operations. Um, that includes return operations from neighbouring countries, but not return operations from other third countries, which was uh, rejected in the, the change in mandate. Um, when it comes to neighbouring countries and the status agreements for the Balkans, one of the concerns we've had is that these agreements establish exemption from jurisdiction, while at the same time um, providing Frontex with executive powers and the power to use force. So this to us is an accountability gap. You see uh, power without responsibility. I wouldn't describe this as externalization of borders because I don't think that expression legally makes much sense. It's rather about a certain transfer of the border management responsibilities of those countries to the EU, to Frontex. Um, but combined with an exemption from jurisdiction, you have power without uh, then uh, accountability and responsibility. The second uh, point I would mention about national level is that generally speaking, under EU and international law, responsibility for officers deployed to a Frontex operation by member states, the responsibility lies with the member state. Um, and there we've seen member states notoriously redu reluctant to address complaints or to, uh, to take satisfactory action when one of their deployed persons has committed or has been uh, has allegedly committed violations. Um, I would say there's a strong similarity here with CSDP missions, the common security and defense missions under EU's foreign and security policy, uh, where there has been a, a similar, uh, I would argue, impunity, including for various serious international crimes. Um, there are things that can be done by Frontex to mitigate the risks uh, attached to this expansion in, in the Balkans, risk assessment, training, due diligence in recruitment, better monitoring, um, transparency, publishing the operational plans, for instance, um, uh, uh, to allow for greater scrutiny. Um, Finally, we, th there's the question of statutory agencies, uh, which provide a form of accountability. I won't give any details because we've already heard the Ombudsman. We will hear from national human rights institutions. We could also mention FRA, the Court of Auditors, and of course the European Parliament itself, uh, which I think can play a crucial role in monitoring uh, Frontex activity. Um, nonetheless, there remains, for all the reasons that we've discussed so far, an important role for truly independent border monitoring. And that is from investigative journalists, such as the report that we're discussing today, but also NGOs and international organizations. Um, here we would recommend supporting existing organizations and networks. Um, there's a, a serious need for funding, of course, but also for security uh, and for the right to operate, as Annalise has described. We've tried to calculate when it comes to EU funding, the amount available for independent border monitoring versus the amount available for border closure. 
um, we haven't managed to put together the exact figures, but you can say that there are thousands and thousands of times more funding available uh, for uh, what we would describe as closing borders and a small amount of money under justice funding for independent border monitoring. Um, there's scope for increasing funding, for instance, under the IBMF, under the ISF, under the AMF, uh, under the other funding programs where uh, earmarking funding for independent border monitoring would go some way to uh, serve as, as a proportionate response to the increase in resources and activity at borders. Um, let me conclude with a few other thoughts. Um, future legislative revision, um, yes, that, that will be one, one. minute. Um, future legislative revision could address some of the weaknesses mentioned. Um, the European Commission could play a stronger role, um, including using the provisions it has on for evaluation of Frontex and using the Schengen evaluation mechanism uh, for more robust assessment of fundamental rights violations at borders. Within the funding, there's also the question of the common provisions regulation, which opens up the need to apply and implement the Charter of Fundamental Rights as a con condition for receipt of funding. And finally, the question here is also about a change in policy direction. Um, in recent years, policy has focused very much on prevention of arrivals, uh, focusing excessively and disproportionately on preventing people from crossing borders. The pact offers an opportunity to change direction and put resources back into building up asylum systems, into EASO to ensure that it is also functioning and making asylum work. Um, and uh, other policy constituencies, I think, can also be mobilized to look at that uh, because Frontex expanding into accession and external policy is also something that creates parallel policy and may undermine policy in those areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, um, for your uh, position and your information. I think you made clear very well that we need a comprehensive uh, system of uh, checks and balances and accountability. We cannot have one body, but they need to be uh, complementary. Um, and actually, you confirm the concerns already made by others that there are some instruments and bodies in place, but the fact is the response, the lack of response, the lack of follow-up, the lack of transparency, and therefore we are not sure if it is effective enough. And I think it also very convincing that you show, apart from that, we need also more also external bodies or, or ways to monitor what is happening. It doesn't necessarily be, have to be a new thing, but we already have uh, bodies like NGOs, international organizations, and uh, for instance, also a national ombudsman uh, we, who will t talk with uh, about later. And But then it's very important that they are facilitated, that they are funded, and that they get access uh, to the places where fundamental rights may be at stake. I think this first panel really gave a very good overview of the current problem issues. I mean, uh, we don't have nothing, but there really is a need for improvement. So very happy to go now immediately to the second panel where we have some, uh, um, some speakers uh, who have experience and who are working towards improvements. And um, especially for ombudsman, we have two speakers who are working in different uh, contexts as ombudsman in getting more involvement and in getting a better a way of monitoring uh, what is happening at the border of the member states. Um, first, we go to Marcus Jaeger. I know Marcus for a long time uh, as he was working in the Council of Europe in all imaginable uh, positions, I would say, a lot of with uh, fundamental rights, of course. Uh, but now he is um, uh, secretary of the Napoleon Group. And I think you will need to explain that a little bit, what, what that is. Uh, but at least I can already say that it has to deal with an initiative of Ombudsman uh, in relation, in cooperation with the Council of Europe to improve the monitoring of, uh, of Frontex operation. But you will explain more about that, the reasons and the purpose of this group. And also maybe you can 
uh, inform us a little bit on the first results. How does it work? And, and, and what can we learn from uh, your experiences? The floor is yours, Marcus. Thank you, Tineke. Thank you, uh, Apostolis. Thank you, dear colleagues from the panels. And uh, hello to all those who have tuned in. Uh, Tineke, I'd like to home in on one of the major areas of concern that was mentioned by virtually everybody, which is um, forced returns of migrants. I'll try to be somatic. So please, those uh, specialists who are here, forgive me for uh, making it a little bit uh, simple. EU law, as we all know, foresees the removal of irregular migrants who have not made an asylum request or whose request has been turned down by a last instance decision of courts with an order to leave. Other people may not be removed. The removal is done either by EU countries alone or with the help of the European Border and Coast Guard Agency known as Frontex. The road of Frontex in these so-called forced return operations by air, sea or land varies. It can go from sheer financial support to doing it virtually alone. This last possibility was introduced last year in the new Frontex regulation. Now, EU and Frontex rules set up how precisely people have to be treated during these operations. These operations, which I would like to point out, are very risky. Risky in terms of human rights violations. People resist these, these very often these, uh, these operations and the law enforcement officers try to respond to that resistance. So you have got risky operations in terms of human rights. There is a very good rule in EU law that says that each and every of the forced return operations must be monitored by at least one independent effective monitor. That's an excellent rule, because one basic rule of all human rights systems is that, as was pointed out before, they need to be effectively monitored, otherwise the rules are worth not very much. However, one problem has arisen, one practical problem has arisen with respect to that good rule you don't have enough monitors for the very many operations that are being carried out. This practical problem has led to a legal problem because a compromise was needed in order to fill the gap, in order to make sure that there is a, a monitor on each and every uh, forced return operation. And that compromise was done on the back of the independence of the monitors and the quality of the monitors. Let me explain. Under an UN instrument of 2006, which is called the OPCAT, most EU countries have set up a so-called national preventive mechanism against torture. These are state bodies established under the law and often under the constitution with strong competences, strong independence. These are some of these bodies that Catherine has pointed out exist. These bodies have a mandate to freely and independently monitor all situations in which people are deprived of their liberty by their national authorities, by the national authorities of these NPMs. When the authorities forcibly put people in an airplane, for instance, to remove them, the NPMs have the indisputable competence to get on board and monitor the situation and to publicly report on what they see. There is no way for the authorities to opt out of that competence. Only the NPMs themselves may decide if and when they want to monitor an operation. And they may, of course, decide to ask somebody else, an expert, to do that for them. Now, unfortunately, EU legislation has introduced certain rules which are in blatant contradiction with these international UN and national rules in EU countries. By doing two things. First of all, EU law has allowed member states to opt out of NPM control and to mandate another body with monitoring forced return operations, another body than the NPM in their country. Whereas the independence and the qualifications of some of these bodies 
are honestly dodgy. Secondly, uh, European law and the Frontex regulation has asked Frontex, Frontex to set up a pool of monitors for itself to try to make sure that uh, there is a monitor available at short notice for each of its own operations. Now, this pool of monitors run by Frontex under the Frontex regulation to control Frontex is made up of a mixed bag of people. You have the very truly independent and mandated NPM members there. You have people from these other bodies which are mentioned that can be designated by member states to control. And, and this is a novelty since last year and it hits the roof, you can have Frontex employees in the pool of the Frontex controllers which means these people have to independently, and here I'm a little bit, a little bit ironic, um, control basically their own colleagues, their own law enforcement officers, uh, colleagues who are carrying out or and or organizing these removal operations. Now, this situation, dear colleagues, is in the minds of some members of uh, the Nafplin, sorry, in the members of the Nafplin group, no longer at all in line with the basic human rights requirement of independent and external, external, external monitoring, which can only be effective. Now, the situation is worsened by the very fact that the results of the existing bad monitoring procedure for forced return operations is not are not made public. This entire procedure lies in the hand of Frontex, certainly of Frontex fundamental rights officer who are very honest and respectable persons, but still Frontex employees. And uh, the system is such that the results of what people have seen, what they have recommended to change or not to repeat are not known to the public. Here, this is a big flaw for any human rights monitoring mechanism. Now, the 12th, national preventive mechanisms who are also most of them ombudsman institutions and national human rights institutions who have made up the uh, NAFTIAN group of which I am proud to be the secretary they asking for two things they make for three things sorry three proposals they say please let NPMs only designate the monitors who will monitor Frontex forced return operations, nobody else. If the NPMs think that because of their workload, because of whatever reasons, they agree with somebody else to be designated, then let them say that, but they will have to receive all these reports and and uh, execute and, and, and uh, use their competence to, to uh, monitor the situation and to render public what is happening in these, uh, uh, in these operations that are done by their own uh, authorities or by other authorities because the pool is there and it's a bit complicated to substitute itself to, to other countries' uh, missing monitors. The second thing that uh, is asked for by the members of the NAFPLIN group is please let the NPMs run the pool, run the procedure, run the process. Let them run the monitoring system. They are the ones who should receive commonly, jointly, in a, joint, in a mechanism to be set up and which is easy to be set up. Uh, jointly, they should receive all the reports, analyze the reports and jointly make recommendations to the various authorities and to Frontex how in the future to avoid human rights violations and ask for the responsibility of those, accountability of those who may have uh, missed target, if I may put it this way, in the past. And thirdly, something which, again, Catherine pointed out, and lastly, is please pay for it. Because uh, if you have a monitoring system, it costs a little bit, it's not expensive. These are existing mechanisms, but please reserve the adequate amount of money for such a system so it can work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus, for this uh, very clear presentation. And your three recommendations, I think, are crystal clear. Uh, actually let the NPMs rule the monitoring uh, of uh, Frontex. Thanks for that. We now go to Debbie Konar. Uh, 
um, Debbie is um, Secretary General, Secretary General of the Network of National Human Rights Institutes. And it's interesting that um, I think there's a lot of overlap if it comes to the, the Ombudsman and National Human Rights Institutes, right? But I understood that your network is uh, creating a pilot more on monitoring uh, member states border control if it comes to fundamental rights compliance and it's not only dealing with returns but also well access and uh, uh, how people get uh, also access and uh, uh, to asylum and the guarantee of non-refoulement so i'm very happy that uh, you are prepared to explain a little bit uh, what you are doing and maybe you can also explain if you have already some experiences uh, um, already uh, made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tineke. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, speak with uh, such distinguished panelists and also uh, to know that so many have signed up for this uh, web conference. Um, as Tineke was saying, I'm here from ENRI, the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions which are often known more briefly as NHRIs. Um, now, as Nick was saying, these are often also ombuds institutions. And uh, Marcus was saying that they often ha also have the NPM mandate. So it can be quite confusing, the difference between different bodies, and often they're all held in one institution. So um, I'd like to start off by explaining in brief what an NHRI is and uh, what they are doing in terms of monitoring at borders. Um, I'd like to underline that uh, looking at the title of this panel, yes, monitoring is useful and it certainly is necessary. And I'd like to finish off with just a few recommendations on how monitoring can be uh, strengthened. Sure. So first of all, NHRIs are state mandated bodies, independent of government, with a broad mandate to promote and protect human rights. So many are ombuds, but what is different is that through um, an accreditation system, NHRIs are tested each five years uh, by reference to international standards, the UN Paris principles, to ensure that they are independent, pluralistic, effective, and accountable. Um, this means that when it comes to looking for independent mechanisms, these bodies, um, if they comply with the Paris principles, will be independent. Second of all, um, a big difference is that all NHRIs, they not only look at protection of human rights, but also promotion. So this means that, for example, uh, while all NHRIs will be monitoring human rights across the country, because they're a national institution, they have an official mandate to advise government, to report to parliament, and also to report to international bodies. But at the same time, they are collaborating with a variety of different actors, including, for example, the Border Police, which NHRIs will be training on human rights, and so really looking to have positive actions and uh, prevent human rights violations where possible. Um, as I said, NHRIs will be working uh, across the state, including on integration, uh, on different areas of the human rights of migrants and all other individuals in the state. But the Committee of Ministers from the Council of Europe has uh, recognised just a couple of months ago the important role of NHRIs in preventing pushbacks. And this is because of their monitoring role at borders. And as a European network, we have been looking specifically at this issue. Uh, in December, we published a report looking at what NHRIs are doing in this area, how they are helping mig migrants, and also looking at um, the evidence that they have found of human rights violations. Sadly, as we've heard uh, from other speakers, there is much evidence of pushbacks, uh, violence at borders, practical obstacles to accessing asylum uh, procedures, and the approach it has been found is, is systematic, it is not ad hoc. Therefore, this clearly needs attention. Also, the reception conditions have been uh, found to be entirely unfit. As we know, uh, detention is used too much um, when alternatives are available, which NHRIs promote. And we've heard already from Catherine about the shrinking space available for human rights defenders and civil 
society. This has become even more difficult now with the COVID onset and actually NHRIs are, they're providing slightly remote monitoring in the do no harm principle, but also collaborating even more with other actors in this field. We've heard about the important actions, civil society actors and many other actors uh, working together. Um, now monitoring is essential to get this information um, and of course, to ensure that human rights are respected. But it's also, as we heard earlier, a question of accountability. We know about the concerns of rule of law across Europe at present. And if there is no access to justice, respect to fundamental rights, equality before the law, and fundamentally, human rights accountability for violations, then we cannot say that there is rule, rule of law respected uh, in Europe. And beyond that, the threats to human rights defenders, uh, including NHRIs, is uh, a grave concern. So the accountability aspect of monitoring must be taken into account. Coming to my recommendations, I uh, have said strengthening monitoring is, in, is very important. We have a lot of information, but we also know there's a lot of under-reporting. However, I would very much uh, warn against the need to reinvent the wall and create more and more new bodies. We already have several actors working in this area, have, as we've heard. If we have another body, there's a risk of undermining the existing work of human rights defenders, civil society, NHRIs, etc. There's also a risk of the bodies not being fully uh, independent, effective, or uh, fully protected by law, as many of these other institutions already are and a risk of duplication. We've heard that there are insufficient resources. We do not want to split what few resources there are between many, many different bodies. So I would suggest instead strengthening the bodies that are there, making sure that they have access to documents, uh, to places of detention. And of course, the NHRIs have this strong official mandate to do so. They need to have adequate resources so the monitoring can be effective, as we've heard several times. And there needs to be collaboration, collaboration with uh, civil society organisations, but also with state bodies to make sure that the high quality and concrete advice is really taken on board and alternatives can be found to the current action. The final re recommendation I'd like to make is that monitoring, of course, is not enough in itself. There needs to be follow up to what is found in the monitoring activity. We have this information, but so often there is not action uh, following um, the information found. So it's very important for the, for the EU to ensure and put pressure on the states to respond um, to the recommendations, for the EU to speak out more loudly and more quickly when recommendations have not been followed up on by state actors and also to speak out in uh, defense of human rights defenders and other actors who have been attacked or frustrated from carrying out their work. Finally, I do believe that uh, enhanced cooperation is needed, uh, both between the different actors that are carrying out uh, the monitoring, uh, but also between the EU and NHRIs. Um, it's, it's possible that many EU actors are less familiar with NHRIs, uh, equality bodies come from EU directives, but the EU has not recognised officially an institution to be a guardian of the Charter, although the EU Council has recognised that uh, NHRIs are uh, crucial actors in ensuring the implementation of the Charter. It's important that the EU and Frontex cooperate further with NHRIs in order to ensure that uh, the monitoring can be as effective as possible and the action be can be taken to ensure there is accountability for any, uh, both individual or structural human rights violations. So ENRI stands ready to uh, cooperate further with um, all of the different actors in the field. And uh, I would also be happy to take any questions later uh, if uh, any come up. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you very much, uh, Debbie, also for your very clear contribution. And it's very much in line, actually, which we already heard. This is all also very satisfying, I must say, that actually uh, you also say that 
we have already instruments, please use them and support them and fund them and, and do not start to create new bodies. I think this is a very clear signal that you give. And it also reminds me of when I was in Croatia, it was also very clear to see that on the one hand, the commission agreed with the Croatian government to come up with a new monitor mechanism, whereas at the same time, the national ombudsman was restricted in her mandate. So this is actually, uh, these tensions should be uh, prevented and uh, we should really also make sure also at the EU level, uh, recognize the mandate of the national body so that national governments should also respect them. So thank you very much for that. I, we talked a lot about fundamental rights, so now it's really high time uh, that we give the floor to the Fundamental Rights Agency, uh, which is Tamar uh, Malna, who is the Legal Research Officer in Research and Data Unit. And of course, uh, FRA has also done a lot of research uh, and is doing now research on pushback actions, uh, uh, how uh, border controls are complying with fundamental rights. Um, so maybe you can say something, Thomas, about possible solutions for the race, for the problems that have been raised until now, how we can make sure that we make the system more effective and, and do we need new instruments or more, how can we make the current mechanisms more uh, robust and effective and uh, create a follow-up? Thank you. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Tineke, for... Uh this opportunity and also the kind introductory uh, words. Uh, dear colleagues uh, uh, in the panel, dear uh, uh, participants uh, online, it's my great pleasure and honor to uh, reflect upon uh, a few issues of, of great importance that have already been touched upon, mainly uh, monitoring uh, at the borders and accountability uh, of, of those authorities or public bodies uh, involved in border management border control issues. First, I would like to zoom out a bit uh, and to have a look at the broader context of border monitoring. Uh, since I will start with the border monitoring aspect, uh, my observations, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. So border monitoring is really flying high on the agenda, but it's been there for a while. For instance, uh, UNHCR uh, promoted that since the beginning of the two of the years 2000 uh, in a number of Central and Eastern European uh, countries, uh, um, for instance, three per tight agreements, arrangements have been concluded between UNHCR, border guards and NGOs to monitor border control along uh, uh, the European land borders of those uh, uh, countries, especially in the light of these countries' accession to the EU. So the examples range from uh, uh, like uh, Hungary, Slovakia, through Romania, Poland, uh, Bulgaria, Lithuania and so on. So uh, there have been already some activities in this field. Uh, even um, there was a joint uh, pilot border monitoring project between Hungary, Ukraine and Slovakia in 2005. It, it's quite far in the past, but it, it was there called Ushgorod process commissioned by uh, the UNHCR as region representative uh, uh, for Central Europe. And, and also uh, when we look at uh, what's happening at the borders, uh, there's already a database covering uh, the Western Balkans. It's run by a UNHCR called Border Protection and Monitoring, uh, which is a helpful tool to uh, get data. My next point uh, around uh, border monitoring is that uh, when carrying out this exercise in the EU, it has to cover all authorities and actors exercising public powers. So it's primarily and traditionally member state authorities, border guards, border police, all authorities involved, as well as there's an emerging new actor, Frontex, which also needs to be monitored to the extent of its involvement in operations at the borders uh, uh, and in third countries. And how to do border monitoring? This is also an issue uh, which leads us to border monitoring methodologies. There are resources available out there. Uh, for instance, again, a code of conduct for border monitoring was adopted uh, in 2004, already in 2004, uh, at the first regional forum on border monitoring uh, and networking uh, meeting, especially for NGOs. Uh, it was called at that time the Trakai uh, Forum. That was the place in Lithuania where this code of conduct was uh, adopted. And since then, 
uh, in the frame of, of different uh, activities, such as the one scared up by UNHCR. Several reports have been elaborated on how to do border uh, monitoring. And even if we take a look at some EU uh, instruments in the EU asylum a key or in the return directive, some bits and pieces speak to monitoring, not in the context of borders, but at least in uh, reception centers or detention centers, uh, uh, where uh, important fundamental rights uh, issues are at their stake. And even lately, uh, even the Commission acknowledges the importance of monitoring in its recent guidance on implementing EU law and asylum and return procedures in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, it's not uh, 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 in the context of borders, but uh, asylum and return. But uh, again, the concept is there. Uh, and, and finally, when, when it comes to methodologies or, or digging deeper on how to do that and what are the, the elements of that, academia can, can inform our pondering and discussions. Uh, the accountability and monitoring at the borders is also in the, in the very focus of legal scholarship. Just see, for instance, the latest special issue of the German law journal uh, published like last week uh, entitled Border Justice migration and accountability for human rights violations. It's uh, uh, exactly what we talk about. Uh, when it comes to uh, the, how to say, uh, monitoring and accountability, a clear dividing line needs to be uh, there. So uh, monitoring procedures uh, uh, cannot substitute uh, complaints or accountability mechanisms. Monitoring can help prevent fundamental rights violations, hence less cases of accountability uh, uh, might emerge. And now just, you know, talking a bit about the, the accountability uh, issues. Um, sure, uh, EU agencies and bodies are bound to respect the EU charter. It flows from Article 51, Part 1. Uh, and the EU, according to the Court of Justice, is a community based on rule of law. So all EU entities need to uh, act uh, uh, in full compliance with those requirements, but still accountability gaps do exist in, in, in EU bodies. Uh, and how to, to, to bridge the gap? Uh, normally EU judicial review, I mean, challenging the validity of EU agencies' actions before EU courts is not, not a good route to human rights accountability at the borders because of the specificity of, of, of the situation. Possible avenues are the EU ombudsman, and we heard a presentation on, on, on this legal avenue, and also the, the EU action for damages using EU public liability or, or tort law under Article 340 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU. So tort liability of public authorities may be an apt remedy for fundamental rights uh, violations. So how to further close the accountability gaps? Uh, strategic litigation is another, uh, uh, let's say, tool. Then I mentioned public liability claims under Article 340. And also uh, member states' positive obligations have already been mentioned by one of the speakers. And I would reiterate that uh, since they have uh, these positive obligations uh, conferred by European uh, uh, apex courts to act to prevent human rights violations. Then going back a bit to uh, the monitoring uh, uh, issue, it's also key to involve all actors, all actors across the board, including independent institutions such as NHRIs, uh, so I, I, I fully concur with, with, with those statements, as well as NPMs. So not just, uh, not only NGOs or the usual suspects, but to broaden the circle as much as possible. Even in some countries, like in Central Europe, this, this, the prosecutor's office can be also involved in this activity, where this body has such function of, you know, a general uh, uh, oversight of legality of authorities' actions. When it comes to elements and activities of, of monitoring, uh, just to, to pick uh, up on, on some like a periodic review of documentation and recording uh, uh, and, and the records uh, provided by, by uh, the authorities, uh, direct monitoring of the day-to-day -day implementation of protection safeguards, visiting BCPs uh, and the company border guard patrols uh, uh, on site, so uh, to be present uh, on the ground, as well as documenting individual incidents. But it can be also broader. Uh, including training exercises on fundamental rights issues. And at the end of the monitoring cycle, a report needs to 
to be adopted uh, uh, detailing the findings recommendations which should be preferably publicly available of course there are many challenges of monitoring especially at remote locations uh, in the woods in the mountains far from urban infra urban inf infrastructure or uh, if if uh, uh, authorities actions uh, occur in the middle of the night so it's hard to be present and to record incidents and to uh, gather uh, evidence. Two more things I would like to mention. The first is uh, if we uh, cooperate, I mean, not we, but the authorities and Frontex cooperate with neighboring third countries to prevent entry, border authorities should conduct a prior assessment on the human rights situation there. So this prior assessment of the fundamental rights situation is key based on a variety of sources uh, uh, to help calibrate planned activities to avoid or reduce the risk of participation in, in conduct which could violate human rights. And uh, um, finally, uh, uh, just to wrap it up, besides ensuring greater transparency of authorities' action, monitoring, border monitoring, can also help identify problems, gaps in training needs on fundamental rights, including, of course, issues to access to international protection, and it serves a structured platform for dialogue among border officials, monitoring partners, NGOs, and other stakeholders. So overall, it's a win-win situation, which needs to be further elaborated on. And my final word, just to uh, uh, link it to your intro, Tineke, yes, FRA is involved in a project of looking at fundamental rights at land borders. We recently published a short joint statement with the special representative of the Council of Europe on migrants, refugees, uh, on, on do's and don'ts and restating the law. And uh, we've also received a request from the European Parliament uh, to prepare a report on the fundamental rights situation at European uh, external land borders. And we will deliver on that later this week. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Thomas, for, for also the overview, actually, of the possibilities that we have legally and politically. And it's very, and also your clear remark that we need to distinguish monitoring and accountability. And I think uh, accountability comes in if, uh, you know, to see if the monitoring recommendations really need lead to a follow up, if, if, uh, if it's taken seriously what is happening. And maybe we already heard some of the recommendations that we see back in the report of FRA uh, towards the European Parliament uh, in its research on the land wars. I'm looking forward to it. Then now, last but not least, and thank you for your patience, uh, Matthias Oel, uh, we now come to the guardian of the treaty. <laughs> and uh, we talked already a lot about the commission. I'm very grateful to have you here. Uh, Matthias Oel is a director of the unit Borders, Interoperability and Innovation of the DG Home and Migration, and um, responsible also for uh, supervising uh, the border control both by the member states, the Schengen Border Code, uh, also the Fundamental Rights Compliance, of course, as well as uh, Frontex, how it's operating. So I'm very curious to hear from you, uh, Matthias, your reflection on how you perceive the role of the Commission if you hear about the problem issues uh, mentioned by all of the speakers, uh, especially also the problems with transparency and accountability followed up, and uh, what the Commission could do to improve, um, well, the transparency uh, and um, monitoring also, that it really can become more effective uh, in the sense of a better follow-up, in the sense of uh, fundamental rights compliance. And maybe you can also say something about the process currently going on with the Schengen uh, evaluation and monitor mechanism, what we can expect. Thanks. The floor is yours, Matthias. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rick, for the, for the invitation. Um, I'm about to say oof uh, after all these presentations, so I will um, refer to several elements which were made by the previous speakers, but also try to put uh, the legal situation into context from the, from the perspective um, of the Commission. And starting with this, let me make a very short reference to, to history. And I think we all have to be aware that fundamental rights within the um, EU law have um, taken a very steep uh, development. 
Um, in a way, they are only in the treaties, in the direct European law since 1999 with the Treaty of, of Amsterdam and 2009 with the Treaty of Lisbon. Beforehand, uh, they were part um, only of the European Convention of Human Rights. So since then, since uh, 11 years now, or 20 years now, they are part of European law. And that brings me to the role of the Commission as the guardian um, of the treaties, because since they are part of the treaties, the Commission, of course, has to um, play this role. And that brings me also then uh, to the border control. I think it is very important uh, to note that um, in case of border control activities, and you mentioned that already, the enforcement of the EU law relies primarily on member states. It is not for the Commission, it is for the member states to implement uh, the border um, management. Um, however, the Commission can, we have to observe the implementation of the law and can, of course, open infringement procedures against member states and bring them ultimately even to the European uh, Court of Justice. A further important point, and it was also mentioned by previous speakers, is that the threshold for the opening of such infringements are not single cases, but the thresholds are a persistent and structural violation of EU law. That means that the European institutions do not replace the work of the national courts, but we act in case of systematic um, breaches. And it goes without saying, and also that was, uh, was raised, that the borderline is uh, difficult to draw and that it has to be drawn on a case-by-case -case basis. Let me now come more concretely to the border controls. Here, two regulations are of major relevance. First, the regulation on the Schengen Borders Code, and second, the regulation on the European Border and Coast Guard. And here it is important to state that the respect of fundamental rights is core in both regulations. According to the Schengen Borders Code, member states shall act in full compliance with relevant law, including the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, the Geneva Convention, and in particular the Nogo Fulamon Principle and Fundamental Rights. And the same applies, of course, we should not forget that, the same applies to Frontex. And let me just mention here, Frontex is a self-regulated agency. Uh, agency. I regret a bit that uh, Frontex is not represented um, in this uh, event. Um, but I will do my best uh, to, to now defend also the interests um, um, of um, the agencies. Um, when it comes to the European border and Coast Guard, I would appreciate that the European Parliament played a very important role that um, in the new Frontex mandate, there are a lot of elements which will help and support uh, the obeyance of fundamental rights. Um, the new EBCG regulation has reinforced safeguards to ensure that European rights are uh, respected. And this includes uh, the obligation to have a fundamental rights uh, strategy, which needs to be adopted by member states um, and the Commission and the Management Board, a mechanism to monitor the compliance of fundamental rights in all friendly activities, a reinforced role of the independent fundamental rights officer monitoring the compliance of Frontex activities. And it has been mentioned several times, but I really would like to underline and stress that under the new EBCG regulation, there will be 40 fundamental rights monitors, uh, and they will only be recruited by 5th December 2020. So we are talking about mechanisms, and we are criticizing here mechanisms, which are uh, legally foreseen but which are not in place yet. So we are working very hard to put them um, into place. And let me make one comment on what Mr. Fotiadis said in the beginning. Uh, he said, you know, that uh, the uh, um, reports of the fundamental rights officers that everything which is going on there uh, is not public. Um, the new EBCG regulation foresees under Article 109, Paragraph 4, that the fundamental rights officer has to publish uh, her annual uh, report in this respect as well, so that in future this will be published. The fundamental rights officer is independent, and the fundamental rights officer also plays a key role in the complaints mechanism 
which was uh, referred to uh, several times. And this mechanism foresees that any person who is directly affected by the actions of staff involved in Frontex uh, activities has the right to submit a complaint in writing to Frontex and the fundamental rights officer will also have a role here. So we are enhancing under the new regulation the monitoring of the fundamental rights uh, significantly. Last but not least, let me come to the consultative forum, uh, which also has been mentioned. And I would just like to, to, to stress that this, fundament this uh, consultative forum is not just a sideshow outside the agencies. I was recently myself present in a management board meeting where it was on the agenda and where there was a long discussion with the representatives about their view on the implementation of fundamental rights. How will now all these improvements um, improve the monitoring of the fundamental rights? Let me raise five points to finish. First, once again, all these new elements still need to be implemented uh, to show their effect. Uh, Frontex and the Commission um, have uh, elaborated a detailed roadmap what needs to be done when in order to guarantee that we keep the timeline um, foreseen. Secondly, let me come back to the title of the uh, webinar, which is Under Surveillance Monitoring at the Borders. And one purpose of border surveillance has been introduced with the Eurosur uh, regulation which foresees that uh, there should be a contribution of Frontex to ensure the protection and saving the lives of migrants. And for a few years, Frontex is now using successfully maritime surveillance aircraft, but also drones and satellites to detect migrants traveling on unseaworthy vessels in the Mediterranean Sea. And I would also like to stress from the other side of the road now that there are many cases in which Frontex surveillance activities have led to search and rescue operations saving migrants from drowning at sea. So there are also positive effects. On the search and rescue, let me once again stress, it is important to note that it is not a European competence. It is a competence of the member states and it's under international, not European law. And this means that Frontex can inform the member states maritime rescue coordination centers about detected search and rescue cases, but we cannot, Frontex, the agency cannot tell them how they should handle these cases. This is up to the member states. Third point, I think we all agree that the best monitoring of fundamental rights is done by being present at the borders. And I would once again, from the other side of the road, say that the presence of Frontex at the external borders of selected member states in the form of joint operations has led to a more uniform application of the Schengen Acquis, including the compliance with fundamental rights in these um, member states. And the eyes and ears will be in future also at the external, uh, at the external borders for the fundamental rights monitors I mentioned already. Fourth point, the Frontex fundamental rights officer and the future fundamental rights monitors are limited, this is important, are limited to Frontex activities. And there's again one element you raised, uh, the colleagues raised, uh, which has to be put into context. That's why I fully agree with all those who have stated here today that we need to set up national monitoring mechanisms um, in addition. Uh, this should be done from our perspective with a clear role for the national ombudsman or the ombudswoman and preferably with the involvement of international organizations such as UNHCR and NGOs. And Mrs. Strick, you mentioned uh, the Croatian um, uh, case and the Croatian Ombudswoman. I can confirm you that we are in touch. The meeting should have taken place, but due to the COVID crisis and the earthquake, uh, we had to postpone it. Um, but uh, this is functioning. So we are, we are in touch there in order also to approve uh, the situation. Fifth and last point, um, compliance with fundamental rights must be ensured not only in the EU member state, but also in neighboring third countries. And for this reason, the European Commission is providing humanitarian assistance to the refugees and migrants in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, just to give you one example. 
So to conclude this brief and uh, telegraphic um, overview, um, I hope that I um, have shown you that we are in the border area in a complex legal situation. I think we all agree with prior national competences and the European border and coast guard in the process of being implemented in particular with regard to fundamental um, rights, but that despite uh, this complex legal situation, the fundamental, fundamental rights are core in all of our legislation uh, with the European border and coast guard being substantially enforced by several instruments, including the fundamental rights um, officer. So let us also see that we implement now what has been agreed. That brings me to your first question in the very beginning. Uh, do we need a new instrument? My answer would be, let's first now see that we implement what is on the table, and then we uh, draw conclusions um, when we have the, made this experience. Finally, because you asked me on the Cheval, uh, on the Schengen evaluation, um, as you will know, the Commission uh, will come up with its report um, on the implementation of the uh, Cheval mechanism for the last five years. And we will do that before the summer break. It's foreseen for June or July. And on this basis, we also then intend to enter into a discussion uh, with stakeholders, you know, to discuss, you know, what was good, what needs to be improved. And uh, the new commission will also then reflect in how far the uh, Cheval mechanism can be reformed in order to make it more efficient um, and effective. But this will then be certainly a topic to be discussed at one of the future, I wouldn't say webinars, uh, but the future panels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthias, for, for your explanation. And uh, maybe first to start by explaining, because you regret that Frontex is not uh, uh, present or participating. I agree with you. We tried several times to get the right. fundamental right officer uh, also in the panel but we just didn't manage to do so so thanks that you also explained the role of the fundamental rights officer in this uh, context um and you also say please uh, let's start implementing uh, what is already there and what is now in legislation and to be implemented i completely agree with you I, let me give me some remarks of uh, <laughs> on your reflections. Um, I think um, it is true, of course, we have this complaint mechanism. And I'm very curious also, maybe the EU Ombudsman will at a certain time evaluate uh, how it works, is if it really meets the conditions that were uh, formulated by the EU Ombudsman. I have the impression that, um, of course, the fundamental rights officer is uh, independent and dealing with the complaints, but at the same time, the executive director also has quite a big role in uh, dealing with those complaints. So I think it would be very good if it would be evaluated at a certain moment to see if, it's, if the independency is sufficiently safeguarded in the way it is uh, dealt with uh, within uh, Frontex. And that the same counts for the 14 monitors, of course. I think, therefore, exactly now we need to be very critical, reflecting uh, the level of independence, because if those monitors, they will resort under the fundamental right officer, if their independence cannot be guaranteed sufficiently, we have lost the battle, actually, and uh, we will not get the added value that we wanted to have these monitors. So I think actually it's very timely to look at it now, how those uh, mechanisms work in practice. And then, of course, the element of transparency, which was uh, mentioned by all speakers almost. I think also this deserves attention also with, you know, to what extent will the work of the monitors be shared with the public, be uh, transparent uh, in order to make sure that we have a, a, a follow up. Uh, here, Matthias wants to add something. Did I see that right? Thank you very yeah. much. Very, very briefly, just yeah. just to mention that this is also new territory. I can I can really tell you that on the role of the fundamental rights officers, on the recruitment procedures, how this will be done in future, 
we are currently discussing this back and forth within the management board between the agency and the commission with DG Human Resources, etc. Because this is all new, we will be in the first time in a situation where European officials will carry weapons and have law enforcement competences. So this has never been the case. And this is also quite challenging to find the right path under the staff regulations in this respect. That's what I mean with, you know, let's don't criticize before it's done. We are really currently doing this. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mati. Hello. Also, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Excuse me, please. The 40 human rights monitors foreseen will be very important. It's a very good step ahead, but please let's not, let's not mix up things. That an agency which is more and more involved into real down to earth human rights um, <clears throat> relevant and human rights risky operations has its own monitors is very good. It's very important and they should have a certain independent status within the organization. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> but they cannot replace external monitoring. Any system, any administrative system has to have an internal way, an internal control, an internal monitoring. And that is what we are speaking about with these 40 monitors. But they cannot replace external monitors. And this is the big problem of the system of Frontex. We need external monitors, external independent monitors as, as uh, opposed to internal monitoring mechanism that works. So both are necessary. We welcome the ones which are internal, but please, please don't tell us it can replace external monitoring. <clears throat> so Okay. Thank you, Marcus. I, I didn't hear Matthias say that, but uh, I think it's good <coughs> to, need to underline that we may need both elements internally and externally. Then we have these checks and balances in place. Um, th there's only one more remark I would like to make uh, to Matthias. He said that's completely true. Most important is to be on the spot so that you can advise uh, officials and see what's happening. And I think indeed Frontex does a good job uh, uh, if it comes to uh, also advising uh, officials. We, we don't need to, uh, we, we need to emphasize that as well. On the other hand, I would also like to see that Frontex is really on the spots where the allegations also take place. So where there are maybe problematic issues like in Hungary, at the places where pushback allegations take place on the Croatian Bosnian border in the Ifras region. And there I find it a bit strange that there there seems to be an agreement between the member states and Frontex that they don't need to be there. Uh, uh, and, and then I think uh, Frontex should be persuasive enough uh, using its mandate to make sure it is there on the spots where possibly fundamental rights are uh, being uh, violated. I saw that Debbie wants to say something. Is that correct? And then in the end, uh, Apostolos uh, will do some closing. I will give everyone a very short time to do some remarks. Debbie, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I was very interested to hear uh, several of the speakers mention the Croatian Ombudswoman. And I have to say her work in this area has been incredible. Um, and her institution have uh, suffered uh, threats and attacks because of speaking out so loudly on this. And there have been attempts to uh, prevent access in uh, places for monitoring, but she has she has achieved it. And she is uh, on our board. She is a member, her institution, a member of our network. As a network that has 45 members beyond the borders, it means that we can also allow for cooperation across borders. So uh, the Croatian Office is also working closely with the Bosnian um, uh, Ombudspersons Institute, which is also an NHRI. And the final uh, point I wanted to make is uh, in response to Matthias's comment about this new uh, monitoring, national monitoring. Uh, that is the exact um, term that is used for uh, monitoring, for example, on JCRP. Under many conventions, there is a national monitoring mechanism identified and generally they require just like the NPMs or for the national monitoring mechanisms to look at where there are violations of the rights of persons with disabilities. They require that the institution is compliant uh, with the Paris principles. And the Paris principles that I referred to before, which is testing and testing. So I just wanted 
find again that when looking at how to create this mechanism, a lot is already there. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We are already running out of time, but I want to give everyone the possibility to say something at least. I saw Catherine raising her hand as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then Fergo and then uh, Matthias and Annalise. Yeah. Okay. Um Thank you. I, I want to briefly make three points uh, in conclusion. I think there's a, a question here about when presence is uh, helps prevent violations and when presence constitutes complicity. And um, this was the dilemma that I think arose in the case of Hungary. Um, and uh, from our perspective, we'd argued that the operation there shouldn't be taking place when there was a situation of systematic uh, violation of uh, EU law as well as international law. Um, and I think on an ongoing basis, this will be uh, a key question. When does the risk assessment show um, that it is better to be present and when not? Because a situation where an agency is present and it doesn't change uh, the fact that violations are taking place is problematic. Um, the second issue, which we haven't touched upon, um, but I think is one that gets into the nitty gritty of Frontex operations, is what we might call mainstreaming fundamental rights. So it's not just an add-on, but when we look at uh, everything from the operational plan, but also to tools that are used outside of operations. I mean, vulnerability assessments, for instance, um, and assessing based also on respect for fundamental rights. And this has been something that is quite absent. So, for instance, the risk assessment uh, that, that appears in the vulnerability assessment, looking at what's happening in member states, um, is not something that has prioritised the potential um, violation of human rights by the, that member state. So I think it's also then allowing the fundamental rights officer to make sure that that role is integrated throughout all aspects of the work of Frontex. Um, this will then, I think, be a question in the senior leadership and the management of Frontex um, to make sure that there's a genuine commitment to operate in that way um, going forward. And then the final point um, going forward is the question of, are we going to have a new legislative proposal uh, expanding the use of border procedure? And the uh, both the risk of increased violations, the need for monitoring at the borders, and the potential changing role of Frontex, and uh, in some cases, AIs or not necessarily in a positive direction. Um, all of that means that, that this uh, will remain a key issue. We hear that um, three legislative proposals are coming and we assume that there will be an increase uh, in focus on the border, despite the fact that we would argue that there's already a disproportionate focus on that rather than on making asylum work within the EU. Okay, thank you, Catherine. I really would like to ask you to just stick to one minute now for the last remark, because otherwise people will just run away because we run out of time for a long time. Fergal, Annelies, and then Matthias. Uh, yeah. I don't see the others, so, and then Apostolos will be. Yeah. yeah, very Fair briefly. I mean, on the on the issue of internal and external control, it's not it's not uh, um, a question of one or the other. You 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 have you have to have both, and of course you yeah. seek to strengthen whatever mechanisms are there. We've heard that there are uh, the monitoring system is being enhanced as we speak. Obviously, it, it, uh, the question is how well will that be done, and uh, it, it, it's. it's it's part of an overall system that fits together. On that overall system, one has to also bear in mind that you're talking about a, a system that's operating both at EU level and at national level, and the systems of control have to fit into that model. The national systems of control can't control Frontex. That has to be done at EU level, either through the, national, either through the Ombudsman or through the courts, obviously, uh, uh, both um, uh, uh, operating to the maximum of their capacity. And on transparency, there's an issue of public access to documents, of course, that should be maximised. We've had a number of cases ourselves. But also bear in mind that the Ombudsman has full powers of investigation, including looking at all files in the, in the possession of, of, of EU institutions, bodies, offices and agencies. So we can go in and look at everything that Frontex has, all of the monitoring reports in full. And that is an important 
a point to bear in mind. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have the maximum amount of public transparency. Um, it's a, an added uh, a mechanism on top of that, but I think it's important to bear in mind that it's yeah. also there. Okay. This was, this was exactly one of the recommendations coming from the public, from the audience, that the Ombudsman should use the own initiative inquiry on transparency of Frontex. So maybe we will hear more about that uh, later on. Uh, Annelise? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Tineke. Um, I think I'm taking up um, uh, Katrin's point about when does Frontex uh, deployment um, um, uh, can help prevent violation or when it becomes complicity. But I and I'm in the context of the new regulation, which has reinforced uh, to some extent fundamental rights monitoring. But it and it has also introduced a new mechanism. Um, it has reinforced the, suspen the suspension mechanism, so to say, uh, in Article 46, whereby um, Frontex can decide in a preventative way to not to deploy to areas where there are consistent, uh, there are serious um, and persistent uh, uh, allegations of fundamental rights violations. In that context, you know, how uh, was it possible for Frontex to deploy staff and assets uh, to border control functions in area marked by these type of reports in a context where the, the right to asylum was suspended, it still remains an open question to us. And in, in this is all, this also applies this thinking to, to Frontex engagement in detecting boats, in alerting coast guards in relation to SAR events in the central Mediterranean. It was mentioned that they have contributed in the past to SAR events, they have in the past indeed, uh, to rescuing people, but in the current context, they're only contributing to people being uh, intercepted and uh, not only pulled back uh, by the Libyan Coast Guard to Libya, but also in there is an allegation that they might have contributed also to a pushback from Maltese uh, um, SAR to uh, to Libya. So just to say, it doesn't. I, we, I don't want this to be only one side of the of the picture being shown. There is more to be said about uh, Frontex engagement and Frontex role and the issue of um, there being no clear accountability system, which would make it unavoidable for Frontex to intervene, to stop violations and to be seen to be doing so. That is really the heart of the of the problem at the moment. Okay, thanks a lot, Annalise. Now I think only Matthias, ah, Marcus also Matthias, and Mar May Marcus I both one minute, and then I go to Apostole and then we need to uh, wrap up. May I also? Uh, after, after yes, of course, of course, of course, of course, yeah. Matthias, Marcus, Thomas, okay. You have to unmute yourself. Now it's better. Um, just on the, on, on the last remark, I think we all agree and we have to be aware that border management is a very, very sensitive issue. And I agree also, it's not about black and white. There is, there is necessarily some gray and that's why it's also necessary to have a good monitoring. Um, and that uh, I wanted not to apologize, but I wanted to underline the important role which uh, the European Ombudsman and FRA as independent external um, bodies play in this in this perspective. Also in reply to what Marcus uh, Jäger said with regard to external um, monitoring. Just ex expectation management. Under the status quo of the legislation we are, uh, we are in, um, Frontex can only go to an external border if it is requested by member states. So, you know, the expectation that Frontex goes where it is currently looking uh, looking a bit odd and that they look, you know, that, that things are going better, et cetera, this is not possible. We are dependent on the request from member states to, to, uh, to, to go there. And Frontex does not have own, own staff going to the borders, but they are dependent also on the provision of staff by um, member states, and also in the future when we will have the standing core, the standing core will be active under the law, the national law of the state where it is deployed and, and, and placed. So this is very important to note. I finish here because otherwise I'm becoming too long. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Matthias. Now Marcus wants to thank you. very the briefly. EU the EU has an agency, Frontex, that is heavily involved in human rights relevant work with a huge risk of human rights violations, heavy, I mean, serious violations. The EU has an ombudsman. Why on earth is the European ombudsman not the center 
of the permanent complaints mechanism against Frontex. I don't get it. Uh, own initiative investigations are nice, but they're not sufficient. They are still ad hoc, uh, ad hoc ways of controlling. I would like to see the European Ombudsman being the person, the institution to whom any complaints against Frontex are being regularly addressed. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Marcus. Um, Thomas? Thanks so much, Tineke. Just briefly, I would like to reiterate that as of now, right uh, now, uh, member states, border officials and border authorities are the key players. So if we look at all the border sections, just looking at the land border section, external borders, uh, we will see national border guards and border police and other uh, competent authorities. Frontex is, as of today, still the exception. Of course, this is coming, but we shouldn't lose sight that uh, strengthening the the uh, uh, border monitoring activities, focusing on national uh, border police and border authorities uh, is key. So we should also create incentives for member states to engage in, at the national level, more border monitoring, as was in the case in the early 2000s with those three per tight agreements. Many of them uh, uh, are not there any longer. I mean, many countries in Central European region uh, have just, uh, uh, how to say, uh, 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 stopped uh, this cooperation with UNHCR and NGOs. So there's there's still room for improvement or or get back to what has uh, worked in the past. For instance, via the new uh, asylum migration fund. So uh, uh, formulating objectives and and the the new uh, AMF can also create incentives. Plus another thing is to put more emphasis uh, in the context of the Schengen evaluations in the domain of border management on uh, the role of fundamental rights. Uh, so so it's, it's also a, a, a channel coupled with uh, Schengen evaluation training sessions uh, to uh, raise awareness uh, 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 about the importance of border monitoring in this context as well. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. And uh, now um, the closing remarks before I really close the session uh, is for uh, Apostolos. Please go ahead. Also briefly, if you can, because of the time. Yeah. Very, very, very briefly. Uh, the complaints mechanism uh, until November 2019 had received 41 complaints, according to a Frontex representative. Um, uh, the implementation of the mechanism has not been vigorous. Uh, this is very obvious. Uh, it's been three years, 41 complaints. Uh, next to the SEER numbers, who do not exist practically, the internal uh, monitoring mechanism has not been implemented vigorously. Now, regarding uh, Mr. Oyl's comments about the current implementation of the adaptations, uh, uh, nobody needs to doubt from now that uh, the Commission and Frontex are committed to a more vigorous implementation. But even if this is perfect, uh, still, the question of independence will remain open, as it has been discussed by many of the today's panel's uh, members. Uh, uh, I will close with one recommendation. If all of us want to be serious about independence of monitoring, and especially when it comes to the project of returns, uh, coordinating returns, which is uh, enlarging very fast, is becoming a huge operation annually, uh, concerning uh, tens of thousands of people very soon, it's already above 10,000 people per year, then a first step would be to discuss uh, uh, the possibility for a change in the returns directive recast, uh, in the specific provision about the character of the monitoring mechanism, and include next to the word effective, uh, which uh, Frontex finds very convenient, uh, uh, convenient uh, to have, because it can increase the effectiveness the word independent, uh, effective and independent mechanism. Otherwise, uh, the issue of independence uh, is going to be left behind and uh, uh, more time will be lost. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Apostolos, and thank you all very much. I think it was a very rich panel. Uh, this is also why we used uh, more, uh, 30 minutes more than, uh, than scheduled, but I think it was really worthwhile. And <clears throat> actually, I think bottom line is that we need to make sure that both on the national level and the EU level, Frontex and national officials have, uh, are subjected uh, by uh, dependent and uh, maybe internal, but also external uh, uh, monitor mechanism. And we need to ensure that this is,
uh, transparent enough, independent enough. And I think that we at the EU level, Commission, but also Parliament needs to play its role, needs to make sure that this is evaluated rightly and that we really get the facts on the table and that people just have access to procedures if things are not going uh, right. And indeed, everyone said, and I really agree with that, we should support and strengthen the existing uh, bodies, uh, ombudsmen, but also organizations, even prosecutors, indeed, uh, to make sure so that um, that it goes, uh, it becomes more effective by cooperation and by putting pressure on um, on transparency to really see what's going on and that recommendations are being followed up. I mean, I think this is the most important thing that we also hear a lack of it. So, with new legislation with increased capacity at the border, I think these issues become more and more important. I think this should not be the last session about this. I really think that it's good to work further on how we can improve these mechanisms. I would really thank you very much for your contribution and I count on you for further cooperation on this. And I would like to say, uh, as closing, we also had a very rich audience because they came up with a lot of contribution. I really regret and I apologize that we did not have a chance to also have a Q&A session properly. But I promise you that uh, we will forward refer, we will investigate the questions and refer them to the speakers and make sure, I hope at least, that you will cooperate with that to come up also with written answers. I think that would be very much appreciated. This works in the legal committee as well, that the commission do, does written answers if we don't have time anymore. So I hope that's possible. Uh, some really good recommendations were there, actually also urging the consultative forum to make use of access of information to information and spots as the regulation for in that risk analysis models of Frontex that are so important to take a look at not only the complaint mechanism but what the risk analysis does and uh, as I already said the EU Ombudsman that uh, please do an inquiry on the transparency level um, of Frontex operations. Thank you very much all of you and uh, I hope that we will all stay and I'm sure dedicated to this issue of fundamental rights and um, have a Good evening. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.